All right. Hey, so I got a request online for someone wanted a video on how to assess a person for weaning and extubation. So I thought that that would be a great video to make for you guys today. So we're going to talk about spontaneous awakening trials, spontaneous breathing trials, and then we'll talk about exactly what we want to look for for extubation. We call this the ABCs, airway and breathing coordination, to decide the right thing to do for our patient. So how we're going to talk about each of these things is we're going to talk about the safety screen we want to perform before we do it, what says the patient did okay or didn't do okay, what made them fail or do well, and then what do we, what's our next step? What do we do now? So um, a spontaneous awakening trial, we want to do this every day for every patient in the ICU unless they have oops, one of these safety issues that make us not want to do that. What safety issues would keep us from doing this for somebody? Um, maybe starting from top down, neuro. Um, concern would be maybe some agitation or... Okay. So eat, I'm gonna go, I'm not sure that I would really say agitation. I'm gonna take that one step farther, actually, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna say, if my patient is intubated because they had seizures, Right? Because they had severe alcohol withdrawal, those would be reasons that I would not want to do an awakening trial. Okay? What about cardiovascularly? What are some reasons that I might want not want to do a, a spontaneous awakening trial? Meaning, I'm just stopping all of my sedative and analgesia medication. Uh, somebody who's on a lot of different vasoactive yeah, perfect. So if you have someone who's in shock and they're still on a lot of vasopressor, that's a great reason not to do this. What else? Um, how recently they've had an MRI? Yeah. So if they had some sort of big stress to their system, like a heart attack, we're not going to do that within 24 hours of that. We're going to let them sort of settle out a little bit with that. Okay. So that's a great point. Okay. What other things do you want to think about? Um, with an MI, if, um, if you had uh, a rest and you're thinking about or um, a hypothermia protocol. Yeah. So if we are treating someone post cardiac arrest with a hypothermia protocol, we want to keep those people sedated. We don't want to stop their sedation. Okay. So those are sort of our neuro things and our cardiovascular things. What respiratory things might keep us from doing that? Somebody who's ventilator dependent already. Yeah, yeah. If we know they're going to need it long term anyway, mm -hmm. then that might be a reason to not do it. Okay, so we want them to be comfortable. All right, so those are the things. If they don't have any of these, they're just a run of the mill infected patient, they got intubated because they had pneumonia and they weren't doing well, then I go and I decide, okay, it's morning time. Every morning, I want to stop their sedation and see what they look like and get a good neuro exam. So I don't mean any of these. Now I have to decide, I've stopped everything. How do I know if I need to restart it or if they're okay without it? What makes me think that, wow, they've failed this awakening trial, they're really doing poorly. What things are you gonna think about there? So that may be where agitation comes in. Perfect. Right? A lot of agitation. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, anxiety, panic attacks. Great. That. Um, severe pain. Perfect. Okay, so those are our neuro things we think about as failure criteria. What are some cardiovascular things we would think about? Um, we think about tachycardia. And really, if they're failing it, we're saying like, you know, sustained heart rates of like 120. Okay, what else? Uh, hypotension. Yeah, so hypertension, meaning systolic blood pressure greater than 200, or hypotension meaning their systolic blood pressure is like lower than 90. Any other things? Um, any arrhythmias. Perfect. Okay. And then any respiratory things you think about? Uh, tachypnea. Yeah, great. So if they have sustained tachypnea, then these are all criteria that say, oof, my patient is not tolerating not being on this. I'm gonna have to put it back on. And when I put it back on, so let's say 
They failed. I'm gonna resume their meds. At 50% of what they were on before, not the whole dose that they were on before. Okay, what do I wanna do if I stop it, it's 30 minutes later, they're chilling, they're looking like a peach, what do I wanna do then? Yeah, then I want to move on to my spontaneous breathing trial. Okay, do you have any questions about that? Does that all make sense? So safety screen, watch them for about a half an hour for failure. If they're doing okay, we move on to our SBT. We're going to approach this the exact same way. Okay, so now to do a safety screen to decide what? what a, what's, a, what's a spontaneous breathing trial? What does that even mean? Allowing the patient to breathe on their own. Yeah, yeah. So what we're gonna do, there's many ways you can do a spontaneous breathing trial. My personal favorite, and there's other ways, so if you disagree, you can do it your way. Uh, but my personal way is that I put a patient on pressure support ventilation okay, with a inspiratory pressure and this is like a delta five. So we can say an absolute inspiratory pressure of five, I'm sorry, of 10, with a PEEP of five and an FiO2 of 30%. So I'm not taking the tube out, I'm just changing their ventilator setting. So you'll also see this referred to as pressure support five over five is how people talk about that, okay? 30%. So again, just thinking about if I have PEEP and then I have five of pressure support on top of that. Another way people do this is they'll put someone on pressure support and there's something called ATC, which is automatic tube compensation. So we'll put them on that with a PEEP of five and an FiO2 of 30, 35. You want your hospital, your unit to have a protocol that everyone agrees to do it the same way whatever that may be. Okay, does that all make sense? Okay, so for us, we're gonna say, after they did great on their, on their spontaneous awakening trial, we're gonna put them on pressure support, five over five at 30%. What's gonna keep me from doing that to somebody? If they failed their safety screen. Okay, so what do I wanna think about as their safety screen? So their safety screen um, would be agitation, Okay. What else? If you can see that already. Um, if they're on, if their FiO2 is greater than this 30%. Okay. So we may still do it if it's go, if it's above 30%, but if it's way higher than that, if it's 60% and they're really needing that, I'm not going to do it. Or if it's going in the wrong direction, right? So if my FiO2 is 60%, I'm not going to do it or if my FiO2 is higher today than it was yesterday, I'm probably not gonna do it. Okay, what else? Um, it might be based on your mode of ventilation, if you're using mm. kind of salvage mode. Yeah, so if I have someone who's on a rescue mode of ventilation, meaning APRV, airway pressure release ventilation, or some other very uh, dependent mode, I may not want to do this spontaneous breathing trial right off the bat. Okay, great. So those are my safety sorts of things I want to think about. What is one other thing I may not want to do? One other reason I may not want to do it. So if my patient has any apneic episodes, if they tend to go a minute without breathing sometimes, patients do this sometimes, that's another reason we wouldn't want to do this. Okay, so those that's our safety screen. How do I know if my patient failed it? So now I put them on this, I'm letting them do their thing, sort of watching from the hallway to see how they're doing. What tells me that they failed? If they become increasingly more agitated Perfect. or somnolent. What else? Um, if they have any severe pain, tachycardia, hypertension or hypotension, any of those kind of changes. Great. What about respiratory-wise? What am I looking for? 
Um, you're going to be looking for tachypnea, um, decreased tidal volumes, looking for retractions or increased work of breathing. Perfect. All of those things are exactly what I wanted you to say. So if my patient is, I'm starting to see they're in respiratory distress, they're starting to really work on that ventilator and it's making them nervous and agitated, then that's failing, okay? If they start, they initially were pulling tidal volumes of 450 when I first switched them over and now we're 15 minutes into it and now they're doing 300, I'm probably gonna stop this making me worry. Um, if they're making retractions, any of these things make me think, oh, my patient is not tolerating this experience well, okay? And then I wanna stop. And so what do I do if they fail? So then you would go back to their prior ventilator settings. And what if they do great? What if none of these things happen? Okay, perfect. Continue to what? Extubation. Okay, so potentially extubation. So how long how long do I want to do this spontaneous breathing trial? Minimum of 30 minutes. Yeah, somewhere between 30 minutes and two hours we generally think about. If someone's just been intubated for a couple of days, then 30 minutes is probably fine. If it's been more extended or you think they're weaker, um, something like that, you may want to do a longer one to make sure they can maintain it. One other point I want to make to you about starting a patient on a spontaneous breathing trial is all night long, they've been doing fine on this mode of ventilation that they finally got used to, and you're going to go into their room, stop their medications that are making them comfortable, and by the way, completely change how their breaths feel. So you want to make sure you go into the room and explain to the patient that you're about to change their vent settings to pressure support because you want to see if you can get their tube out today and just tell them to expect this is going to feel very different. I'm going to expect you to do more work on your own so they know what's coming. Okay? Any questions about that? All right, perfect. So now we did our spontaneous awakening trial, our spontaneous breathing trial. We coordinated them and I was successful. So now I have to decide if I'm going to extubate my patient or not. I'm writing it huge. Because this is my very favorite procedure in the ICU. You're taking someone from a struggling person on a machine and making them themselves again, and I love it, okay? So what do we want to think about so that we make sure we do this safely? What do we want to know about the patient? What do we want to know about how they're doing? So we want to know if they're mentally intact. Perfect, what does that mean? Uh, GCS greater than eight so that they can protect their airway. Okay, that's actually not good enough for me. Okay, so I'm not okay with them having just a GCS of eight. I wanna make sure they can follow commands. I wanna know that when I take the tube out and I tell them to cough, 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 they're gonna cough, cough, cough. Okay, they have to be able to lift their head off the bed, have to be able to cough, have to be able to follow my commands. But absolutely, you wanna be able to protect their airway. The other thing that goes along with protecting your airway, I'm gonna write following commands here first. is making sure they don't have a whole bunch of secretions that they're gonna cough or gag on or that are gonna go back into their lungs and create more problems, okay? So we looked at their mental status, we looked at what they're so, we just go in and ask the nurse what their secretions look like. They always know, because they're awesome, okay? What else do I need to know? How well are they oxygenating? Perfect. What else? How well are they ventilating? Perfect. What else? Do they have a leak? Okay, what does that mean? So that's um, sometimes our C. diff, but you can look in to see um, a nurse um, where you're looking to hear if there's a leak around the cross of yeah. the trachea. I wanna make sure if I take that tube out that their airway is not gonna close in on itself, okay? So what I can do is I can take that balloon down suction really well in there first, right? Do all my suctioning before I take a balloon down, but then take a balloon down and make sure I can hear air passing around it. You can also do that quantitatively, plus minus. We don't do this on every single patient um, if we don't have any reason to believe that they have any risk factors, but it is absolutely something to consider. 
Okay, lead test, what else? Have we fixed the problem? Yeah, right? So did we fix the reason that they got intubated in the first place? If they have pneumonia, did we fix the pneumonia? If they have pancreatitis, is it getting better? Right, are we on the right track? So we're not gonna have to reintubate them if something goes awry. Then there's one more thing that I want you to learn about today, and it's called a rapid, shallow breathing index. So you'll hear it called a RISB. Okay, and you can remember how to calculate that. Come back over here. Because it's rapid, the rate that they're breathing, so their respiratory rate over their tidal volume in liters. So if they're taking 500 cc's of tidal volume, then that would be 0.5. So if my respiratory rate is 20 and my tidal volumes are 500 milliliters, then my RISB would be 40. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm gonna put tidal volume in liters. And we want that to be less than 105 as one more indicator that's gonna make us feel even better about taking this tube out, okay? So we wanna do all of these things. Look at the big picture of your patient. Make sure they're doing better. Make sure you're suctioning the heck out of them above and below the balloon before you do it. And if they meet all these criteria, then we get to do my favorite procedure in the intensive care unit, which is extubate your patient and make them them again, okay? Any questions about any of that? All right, thanks for your attention, that was awesome.